everyone, it's Jessica Donegan and I'm here with another episode of Workshopped It, a series where we look at a published book and we talk about what I liked and what worked and a couple elements that we could tweak just a little bit to bring the whole story up to the next level. This episode is going to focus on the Faring Apocalypse series, in specific the first book, Stray Magic by Jenny Swartz. Jenny Schwartz is a very planned writer. She starts each year and each month with what she's going, what her plans are and what her deadlines are, and she pretty much sticks to them. Because of this, you can see a pre-order and a Amazon page for her books ahead of time, which means that she has to create summaries, book covers, everything like that for the whole series before she's written the books. Because of this, if you're reading one of her series ahead of time, you're probably looking at a standing cover and you're also probably looking at a summary that's not her completed work. I started this series, The Fire Rain Apocalypse, when she had completed book three. I saw this cover and I also later got to see this cover and finally it looks like the book has finished with this cover. As you can tell, the first cover um, it's definitely a placeholder. All of her covers looked like that for all five of the books when I read them. And the second cover is better, but it's still a little bit generic. I like the final cover she settled on the most because I really enjoy the colors, they're welcoming, and the symbols create interest for me. They um, don't introduce us to one character specifically, but there is some interest and diversity going on there, which I really enjoy. Overall, it's probably not a book I'd pick up by the cover, but it's the summary that drove me in. The current summary on Amazon is different than what I originally read. I'm not going to read that one to you. But the best parts of the original summary are actually found right in the prologue in this story. Uh, as readers know, I don't like prologues. This prologue is no exception. I would not recommend a prologue. In this case, this prologue, as far as I'm concerned, should be the summary for this book. But I'm going to read it just so that we can be on the same page about why I started reading this series. The pre-faring governments collapsed the day the Red Drake ate the failed Fukushima nuclear power plant. Three days after that, the internet went down. Television died a day later. Radio lasted three weeks and four days from the opening of the rift. Within a month, communities across the globe were on their own. As technology failed, epidemics spread. After a nightmare six months, Earth's human population had been reduced to one billion people. Survivors learned the statistic via the proclamation of their new overlord, Fay King Harold. We can now begin rebuilding, to traumatize humanity, his words sounded like mockery. Humanity was wrong. Harold's intentions were honest. The Fairine who came through the rift had a plan. Earth wasn't their first world to be claimed after the shield that protected the Healthy World Tour. The Faring knew what had to be done for the new society of mixed beings to be born and flourish. What they hadn't anticipated was for mages to begin appearing in the human population. That changed everything. Amy Carlton would be one of those mages, but first she had to survive the Faring apocalypse. But for me, that summary was great because it showed me a bunch of different fantasy creatures, which I was looking for in a fun summer read. It gave me some strong prepper post-apocalypse vibes. It explained why humans were interacting with the Faring. It showed that there was some fear, some danger, and it also showed the potential for a redemption arc, or maybe not, depending on that race. So there was a lot of interest, like what's going on with that race? What are their plans? How do humans play into it? Where are we going? I wanted to see where we were going. There were some concerns I had too about this story. Mixing like a science fiction and fantasy can be dicey. And there's a lot going on in this story, too. There's an apocalypse to talk about, so we have to take modern society and break it down. There's where we are now, there's magic, there's where these beings came from, there seems to be a lot of different kinds of beings. I was worried that it would be overwhelming for the story, it would be too much to handle. Especially because the first book in this series is 150 pages, and that's not a lot of time. And I really want to hear more feedback and comments with what you guys think as well too. What would you want from a series with this premise? Go ahead, pop in the comments below and let me know. So chapter one through five are all pretty solid. They establish our main characters, Amy Carlton. We find out that she is a rich white kid from New York City with neglectful parents and that she intended that she's going to college and intends to be a doctor. 
to this end, she is helping work at a camp for children with um, disease so that they can have an away camp experience. And we get just like a little taste of that camp life before news breaks out that all of a sudden there are appearances all over the world of different fairy beings like dragons or griffins, um, unicorns, that kind of fantasy. And it's happening all across the world in a way that most people don't believe it's staged. But there are some people who are thinking like deep fakes, all that kind of thing. And it doesn't take too long for the parents of these children to get too worried about their kids to let them stay at camp. So the kids all get picked up and camp pretty much sh shuts down for the summer no matter what's going on in the larger world. And Amy, she's not sure if she believes what's happening or not, but she knows there's no one waiting for her at home in New York City. She thinks if something serious is happening, being in the city with the riots and stuff going on due to people's fear is probably the last place she wants to go. So she asks another counselor if there's anywhere in town locally um, she can stay. And her friend slash co-worker introduces her to her aunt Stella, who is 70 and pretty much owns her own old school farming homestead. So Amy does get to stay with Stella. The two of them get on the same page about what kind of preparations they're going to make. Uh, they invite an ex-vet who comes vouch for his name is Digger to come live with them as protection in case things get rough. Digger brings a dog with him. Eventually they're also joined by a mechanic that's good friends with Stella whose name is Mike and the two sons he have that he has that survive returning home. And that's going to be Craig and Jared. So we've got our team, we've got a farm they've got to take care of. They're also going to try and protect the town. Um, they're located close to town but just on the outskirts. Also, they have a working well, so when electricity and all these other things go down, they're going to have everything they need there on the farm, and they're going to be in a good place to help the rest of the surrounding townsfolk, too. So they all sort of agree that this is going to be their lifestyle, and they're going to ride this out together. There are a couple elements of characterization going on that are happening really well, and I want to highlight. Amy and Stella are shown to be very practical people, even though they have different ages and life experience. Um, both of them waffle back and forth about whether or not this dragon and unicorn thing is serious and real, or whether it's a joke. And they both agree that either way, people are panicking and they need to get ready for it. That's their whole justification. And a lot of other people who they end up adopting and taking in feel the same way. And this is a great characterization for where both of them are in life and it's also interesting um, how Jenny Schwartz strategically places different military people or ex-military people in the world around them. I think too it's no coincidence that they're in Pennsylvania which is kind of Amish country even though they don't use the Amish in this story in any way the fact that there is farming happening there's roots to like a traditional old-fashioned way there's museums and other stuff like that. There's a proud long heritage. And Pennsylvania is low enough down where the winters are still really cold and inhospitable. But they just get those couple extra weeks of farming that makes it believable that you could survive that way without being so assured as it might be in like a southern area where farming should be much easier with or without technology. Some things that aren't going so well for me characterization wise is I'm still not sure why Amy specifically is our protagonist. She's very perfect. Um, she, you know, is young and well intentioned. She has a ton of training and survival skill knowledge. She's had access to a lot of things and in the early days because her parents are rich and have been giving her continuous bank account money she's able to buy a lot of supplies that they need to. If we were going for realism, these elements would be troubling, and as far as if you're looking for varied perspectives, this might also be not your book. But if you're looking just for a prepper fantasy, this might be perfect for you. To me, it reminded me a lot of the show Doomsday Preppers, where, you know, there are all these people, like, in suburban homes with 12 years of food in case of a solar flare and they have like all these drills and skills that they're using and 
you know, it's interesting and it's satisfying to see someone have this training and put it to use. It's satisfying to see like our ex-vets use this way, or at least it was for me, you know, where they're trying to project calm, they're using their army and survival training to help civilians, where they're establishing what's important and building alliances in a way that would be meaningful. And two, it's also uh, very satisfying to see someone like Stella, who's 70 plus, that's how the narrator describes her, being physically active and mobile, using her different information, um, using all the stuff that she's stored over the years and kept taking care of to their best use. All those elements are satisfying. It's not a conflictless apocalypse. They do face other human opponents who are less than savory. But it's nice to see that as a whole, humanity's done their best, at least in this one little town, to come together and to try and keep everyone safe and secure. So if you're looking for like an apocalypse that's showing some of the best in humanity, and if you're looking for multiple ages, although not multiple backgrounds that are coming together to survive, then this could be a great book for you. You know, I wouldn't change anything. I would just point these things out for readers so that they know what they're getting into. So they, Craig, one of Mike's kids, makes it home, and the first thing he says is that they all have to go inside and turn on the TV, that they've been playing over the radio, but they're going to have to see it on the TV to believe it. So they're at the TV, we're watching it, and this is what happens. Humans, the dragon begins. How he could speak was a mystery. His long scaled muzzle was too full of teeth to form human words. Yet he was on screen addressing a planet of terrified people. It was ominous to hear ourselves referred to as humans. We were no longer the sole sentient species of our planet. You have seen my dragon kin and few representatives of other races. As a collective, we are the Farine. We have what translates as magic to your understanding. There are far more of us than you have seen. He paused. The camera operator took a chance to pan back, revealing the dragon's red, immense size as he stood in the street. The dragon resumed. All healthy worlds have a shield that protect them from invasion. Unfortunately, you have weakened your world shield so profoundly that Earth's shields tore. We entered through the rift and we now guard it. Far worse than us exists in the universe. The sooner the shield is restored by being returned to your planet, the safer humanity will be. However, I am not here to deceive you. The price for restoring your planet will be tremendous. This is not a debt you will repay us, but an overdue accounting Earth demands for your survival. Jared squeezed my hand and I realized I clutched hold of him at one point in the dragon's sinister speech. We will allow you to keep your internet for three days. We hope your governments and informed authorities will use it to advise you and prepare you for what is coming. Within a month, electricity will fail. Petroleum-derived products will return to the earth. There will be no fuel for your machines. Plastic will vanish. I will tell you this so that you can prepare, but you won't be able to hold back the apocalypse. Three days from now, bodies will disappear after their death. They will be returned to the earth immediately. This will continue for six months, if not longer. I'm sorry to say, but you will be grateful for this mercy. This is the big scene with the red drake that is revealed in the that was revealed in the summary when I read it, and that is in the prologue now for this book. And it's a cool scene to see it on TV, to have a dragon speaking to the people and explaining exactly what to expect from this apocalypse. This video take is a turning point for the camp. Um, any considerations that this might be a prank or a deep fake, they're over now. The timeline, the sense of urgency that this speech gives is really good in the book. Overall, the first third of this book is really tight. There's not anything I would do to change it. The prepper fantasy is a little bit more escapism. Everything seems to go just a little too smoothly. But to me, some of that can be explained by the fact that Amy, our protagonist, she has some magic and we find that out starting in chapter 5 and going forward and then we start dealing with what that means. So maybe part of the reason things seem to go so smoothly is magic and also a lot of the people locally were farmers or were able to do some kind of smithing or other talent that you can do without electricity and that's in high demand. So the people themselves might not have been as conflicted changing back in this way. 
So it's going to be interesting to see the environmental themes going forward. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out in the book and what it means for people to be living in a long gone time. I'll be curious to see what they do with the Farine too. They still need to do more to be a turnaround from being an antagonistic force. I know that it's set up in a way where they're not intentionally antagonistic, or at least they're presenting themselves that way, but from my perspective we have no reason to believe everything that they're saying. I am still concerned that maybe this was their intention all along was to, they were able to take away our technology, now they're the people in power, and we surrender to them. So far I haven't seen anything that would make me think otherwise, and I'm looking forward to seeing that from them, to getting some more humanizing elements, or to see more of their culture, or maybe to see some kind of proof they have so that I can be on page with them. So chapters 1 through 5 were all told in Amy's first person's per perspective. In chapter 5, we change over to Eastbound, who's Griffin's perspective, and it's really jarring. If I were the author, I would not include this chapter. It doesn't give any information that I feel you need for this book or for any of the books in the series, and it just is such a strange tonal change. Istvan, the Griffin, and most of the Farim, their lives have, they have been fighting and struggling, or at least that's what Istvan says. You know, they came through the rift and they had to use their magic to create a barrier and then hold that barrier. And it seems that there's been some kind of fighting and conflict involved in holding it and that there have been sacrifices made to maintain this. Um, some of their fellows have died, even. So it's not totally without sacrifice. Eastbound's not a great vehicle for this. As a griffin, he seems to be very focused on justice. He's kind of cold and his whole personality feels very old-fashioned. I got like strong Mr. Darcy vibes from him. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just a very stark contrast from what we've been dealing with. You know, on the human settlement side of things, there's been a lot of people that uh, both Stella and Amy were close to who have died. There was a scene where Amy had to kill people to defend others she loved. They had just finally come together in a harvest where they were celebrating a good years of growth together as a community, and a dragon had come down and demanded that Amy go with them. So everything's really tense on the human side. Even when good things are happening, there's these farine coming in and not giving them a chance to celebrate or acknowledge those. We go from this tight wound community, this trial by fire kind of scenario to this dude who is relaxing in the snow after a victory and whose friend is sort of like playfully shoving at him and egging him on to come to the trials. It feels really strange. The first time I read this, I don't think I even read chapter 5. I think I skipped it because the tone is so jarring and because I just didn't care about this dude. That's the other thing, is we have no information about a griffin. Like, if we had been talking about the Red Drake, I might have been more interested. We had had a connection with him already. He talked to us through the TV. I might have been like, that dude who communicated with humans, let's hear more about him. Also, I kind of like dragons more than I like griffins, so that by it, all by itself might have been more interesting to me than a griffin. Also, I sort of feel like the griff, the dragon personality would have been more interesting. I feel like he's fiery and he's impulsive. I feel like he has a little attitude and swagger. All of that would have been more relatable to me and would have been tonally more in line with some of the things that humans were doing. Where the griffin, you know, sort of like the, oh, I used too much magic and I'm just now realizing it and I've like burnt myself and now I'm in the snow. It just it just didn't connect for me. It's not even that I didn't like it or that it couldn't have a place. It didn't connect. And the chapter is very short and we don't really get many other scenes from Istvan's point of view. Um, in 150 pages, there's just not a lot of time to do split views. Personally, I think everything from Amy's point of view, especially in this story, would have made sense. So we're at chapter 6 now, and we're back at Amy's perspective with the dragon, 
the copper dragon is saying, I require Amy Carlton. But Amy steps forward and she agrees to go with the dragon and the dragon teleports her to what's left of Manhattan. And at this point in time, we see that Manhattan has been returned pretty much to trees. There's not any more skyscrapers, or bridges, and there's clearly no people living there. And I just want to read a scene to you from how Amy reacts to this. Remember that Amy originally was living in New York City, even though she decided not to go home. This is where her family lived, and she doesn't know what happened to them, and this is where her friends were. And she had been keeping traps of her friends with her phone until electricity went down. So she has no idea how long her friends stayed in New York, if they made it out. She doesn't know any of that. And now she's looking at the city and it's just gone back to nature. What have you done? Where are the people? The dragon released me and I dropped to my knees. You recognize this place? It asked me. I used to live here. I grew up in Manhattan. This was my home. I spoke so slowly it sounded as if I had a speech impediment and struggled with every word. The re reality was that the shock and grief choked me. Humans were herded from here before we returned the buildings and other technology to the earth. We needed a gathering place for the farine of the region. So you stole ours? The demon sighed. Restored it. Did you have family here? No, but I had friends, people I knew, good people. Good people have died everywhere. I ran forward and punched the dragon's muzzle. So this is a pretty cold introduction to the Fa'arim, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, they knew that people were suffering and that they were going to die. Whoever was still left in New York City, and we have been left to believe that a lot of people chose to evacuate the cities after the Red Drake's warning. Not that there's much we as an audience or Amy herself can know, but some people decide to stay, and that makes sense because there would be a lot of canned goods, um, there'd be a lot of resources left abandoned in the city, and a lot of these post-apocalyptic uh, futures, we see a lot of people scavenging cities for quite a few months after society collapses, so it's quite believable that people would stay, um, especially because a lot of city people may not have the skills to farm land. So they might think they like their chances better scavenging and trading and hiding in places that are already built. So it is here that the Farine forced these people out, forced them out to where? Did they provide them with any items or any skill sets? Did they make sure they got to another colony that could help them? Did they just, you know, kick them out to city limits and take all the stuff they were using and were hoping to survive off of and return it to the earth? It leaves a lot of questions, and it makes the Farine out to be definitively monsters. You know, they just shoved them out of a place that they wanted to occupy and made it look the way they wanted it to. Another thing that's an interesting theme to me is the idea of restoring things. The Farine obviously has some kind of pro-environmental agenda going on, and they're displaying what to me is like the opposition's view of what an environmentalist narrative is. You know, like, I would consider myself a environmental, an environmentally aware person, you know? I try to reduce my waste, I recycle, I do all the things that people suggest that you do to try and help preserve the earth, right? And I'm concerned about the status of our environment, but I'm not interested and taking cities and returning them to a state of nature. And if we did that, I wouldn't consider restoring anything. The dragon calling what they did a restoration of Manhattan is pretty silly. I mean, Manhattan, it was originally swampland. Who's to say that it would still even exist? Um, you know, I know quite a bit of dirt had to be brought in to build it up so that it would stay above water regularly. Whatever they've done to sink the buildings back into the earth or whatever. I mean, did they take the dirt away? Like, did you really just restore it or did you put a bunch of trees there and decide that it was yours now? And also, like, why did they need to use Manhattan? Where they can teleport places? It doesn't seem to make sense to me that you would just erase what was the existing people's, like, point of origin or point of importance and put your point on top of it. That seems malicious. 
And it's little slip-ups like this going forward drag this novel down. Because it's clear to me that I'm supposed to like the Fahreen. And I'm supposed to think that they're good people and be happy that they've like, not necessarily happy, but understand why they've come in and sort of side with them or see things from their point of view. And I just can't. And the reason I can't are moments like this. Um, but also the whole concept of ripping Amy from her adopted family and taking her by force to this other thing that's happening. And we'll get more into detail here, but I want to say the way that the Farine handled the discovery of magic in humans is a huge fail. And I'm going to end up pitching a whole different series of events for the back half of this book. So this conversation between Amy and the Copper Dragon seems to stir some kind of empathy within the Copper Dragon. This means that the Bronze Dragon decides to give Amy some information. So she tells Amy that she's going to these trials and at the trials you will be taught who we are, the Fareen, are, and why we are crossed to Earth. It was a one-way journey, child. For us there is no return. Earth's future is now ours. We are your allies. I haven't seen anything that indicates to me the Farine are allies. I've seen that the Farine saw an opportunity to invade Earth, and I've seen that they want, they find Earth a good resource, easy to shape to a way they seem to like it, and that they seem able to take over and do what they need to do. They seem to be living pretty well. Yes, they had to restore the Earth's barrier and they may have had, they may have incurred some injuries along the way. But first of all, they went into this knowing that was the situation. So they chose that. And second of all, you know, people choose to take risks to get rewards all the time. So who's to say the Farine didn't see this as a strategic advantage to come in and take over? And the fact that all I can think of is the Farine as overlords when there have been so many attempts to try and portray them as good, and there will continue to be attempts to try and portray them as good, um, to me is a significant opportunity within the book. It would be more interesting if I could believe the Farine um, we're on our side in some way. It would be a far more interesting story. I want to ally with them so bad. You know, they have magic. They're all these cool, fun, different species that have all these unique quirks and abilities. Like, I want to fall into this farming culture and never come out. They've done so much damage, I'm going to need more than I'm getting. Like, calling Amy a child and telling her she's going to go into these trials isn't enough. Amy and her have been going back and forth, and Amy wants to know why she's going to these trials, why she needs to learn more about the Fareen, why it's her specifically. The dragon says, Amy, you have magic. This will be explained to you at the trials. Your ability to channel magic is a recent awakening. The Fareen have observed your world for centuries, and despite the fairy tales humans told each other, You've never managed to tap Earth's magic. Until now, our analysts suggest that the presence of Farine using magic has triggered this ability in a few rare humans, such as yourself. No, 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 I don't want magic. No fireballs, no. You channeled magic to heal people. So this scene is good too because it explains some of the things that were going too easy for Amy. Um, she ends up helping the doctor the two nurses in town pass away and she takes over a section of the doctrine and her patients are far more likely to survive than anyone else's patients. In fact, something we find out in this section right here is nearby towns and people passing through come specifically to Amy for her to bandage them up. She's so pleased with herself, she's so happy that she's been able to channel this magic and help her fellow humans in this way. It's really endearing to Amy. A lot of this story makes me like Amy a whole bunch. I just wish that some of the thought that was put into building Amy as this kind and caring person had been put towards characterizing the Farine in a more friendly way. Okay, so they meet up with a bunch of other humans and go through a big portal 
to what appears to be somewhere along the Black Sea. I'm not sure how Amy recognizes it as the Black Sea, but at some point in time in the story they mention it. It's colder there than it was in Manhattan, New York, and Amy's not well dressed, but it's okay because everyone gets new clothes. That gives me some hope that when they kicked everyone out of New York, maybe the Farine gave them something. It would have been nice to get more information on that. I'm really hung up that they just force marched everyone out of a home and <laughs> took their homes and destroyed them. I can't get over it. I'm sorry guys. I will move on. But once all the humans have come in, they gather and the representative for the Farine's name is Lajeos, I believe. L-A-J-O-S. I'm going to be calling him Lajeos. And he's an elf. And he says, you're free to leave the trials at any point. An unwilling familiar will be dangerous. A stir swept through hundreds of us humans. People moved, not quite standing, but unable to prevent a physical reaction to the promise of escape. Which, you know, it lets us know that these people don't want to be here. All of them are scared and worried. And the other thing this lets us know is that these people with magic, they're not going to be able to just go about their day and they're not going to be trained they're going to be um, subservient in some way to Fareen in a process they call familiars. Let me just keep reading this now. However, let Jaios continue, if you choose to leave these trials, if you decide you cannot be a familiar, you will be executed. We brought all these people in against their will. We got their hopes up that they could leave. And now he drops the hammer, you will participate in these trials, and you will become a familiar to a random farine for the rest of your life, or you will die. I don't want to use the term lightly, but this is slavery. Like, definitely slavery is what is happening right now. So this race that I'm supposed to see as benevolent is enslaving humans because they randomly got the ability to perform magic, which they admit is a farine problem. The presence of farine causes this problem. And now they're going to be forced into a series of unpleasant trials and <laughs> put up with someone they don't know and the whole rest of their life is going to be dictated by this other being. It seems very cruel and I don't know why I am supposed to feel sympathy for the people who are doing this. They keep saying that they have to, that having unstable magic users puts everyone at risk and they're implying that humans who complain about this are just unwilling to do their duty or unwilling to pitch in. But I think the Farine have not considered what they are saying. It's very interesting too because the Griffin characters, Istvan, um, and there are two others as well whose names I don't remember, they all seem to be on board with this. They seem to think this is fair and just overall. And it takes quite a bit of time as these trials progress for one of the three of them to see that this might be an inequity and to think that they might have something to make up to humankind. The other thing about these trials is that they seem to not have a strong drive. They're called the trials and the end goal is to match humans up with Farine and make the humans familiars to the Farine. But how they're going to go about doing this, it feels like the Farine haven't planned it out because they start with like some kind of meditation wishy-washy thing and then they make the humans go into hand-to-hand -hand combat and then they do some more meditation and then they throw in some random history lessons. It's just not structured and well planned out and it's hard to figure out exactly what the Farine's goal is because they're giving the humans good clothes and they're giving them like banquet feasts and they're housing them in nice, in nice tents and nice safe warm bedding and they make sure that the humans can sleep at night. They have like these sleep spells because they know the humans are anxious and probably because they don't want to deal with uh, potential runaways or issues at night too. But at the same time they provide these showers that are cold showers when they have the capability to make the water hot. And they don't explain a lot of things that are going on to the humans. Like they do this meditation and right from the meditation they go into hand-to-hand -hand combat and they don't explain what the hand-to-hand -hand com the goal of that combat is. They don't account for the fact that oh, there's about a hundred people there, and probably 
a lot of them don't have any fighting experience. They do try to pair the humans up with similar body types, but that doesn't help if one of them's an experienced fighter and the other one's not. And uh, this is all told from Amy's perspective. Amy is a trained fighter. She's trained in quite a few different kinds of martial artists, arts, and so she gets to continue to do these fight exhibitions for a little bit longer. But the Farine are really dismissive of her. She eventually does fall to Chen, one of the other humans, and he's also a trained martial artist, and the two of them are kind of doing like an exhibition fight more than a real fight, and they're having a good time with it. And the Farine is very dismissive of Amy falling and tapping out as a yield. She, you know, they talk to Chen like, oh, it's super cool that you showed mercy to a lesser opponent. And you can see Chen makes a face and Amy tries to ignore it and the two of them go back to sparring for a minute before the Farine forced both of them to freeze with magic. But they never specified that they couldn't continue to spar. The whole scene is weird. They didn't seem to understand the two of them were sparring instead of really fighting. They didn't seem to understand the two of them had talented fighting skills. And you would have thought, since these people came to close the rift and protect us from another evil alien race, that they had fighting skills and knew about different fighting styles. And even if our style was different than theirs, they would recognize a stylized fighter. And they'd recognize two well matched stylized fighters sparring instead of actually fighting for their lives which they don't seem to be able to do, and they don't seem very respectful to forms or the ability to fight. They're pretty dismissive of it. Maybe they don't feel like they need to know all that because they have magic. To physically show that you can control someone's body like that, which rightfully freaks Amy out. Um, and also some of the other Fae talk about how this is not a normal thing, that freezing a body like that is actually uh, not kosher. Again, why would you do that with humans that, that you keep saying are equal or going to be respected if that's not a cool thing to do to your other farine? The farine don't know what they want from humans. They don't know what they want from this relationship. And it seems to me that they're actually trying to find a reason, an out, like a reason that they can be like, oh, well, they just wouldn't go along with us, so we killed them. Um, while making the ability to go along with them so difficult that humans don't have much option. Instead of pulling Amy out from her universe, from her world, and bringing her to the Farine camp for trials where the humans have to participate or die, what I would do is I would have the Farine recognize these magical anomalies, and I would have the magistrates of each territory, because the Farin have divided the world into different territories and they have magistrates ruling them, I would go ahead and have the magistrate assign a team to look at each individual case and observe it. Because we already know that the Farin can observe humans without humans knowing. So maybe at the fall festival, instead of calling Amy over and demanding that they go with her to this trial, the Faring could reveal themselves and ask to speak to Amy that way. And then Amy could go over to them and have a sidebar. And she could, you know, then, I don't know if you want to use, if you want to use the Bronze Dragon still, or if you want to use the Griffin, or if you want to use the Red Drake, or if you want to use the Elf Girl that gets introduced that I don't mention, or the Werewolf Guy that gets introduced that I don't mention. That's the other thing, there are a lot of Fae that are coming in past the halfway mark that don't, they matter later in the story, they matter quite a bit later in the series, but they just don't matter to me right now. I've spent all this time creating family and building up with these human characters, and you've just ripped her away from these human characters, which makes me feel like that time was wasted and didn't matter, and you've dropped her into these Farine characters, who I'm supposed to care about and sympathize with, and it's hard to do that when what they're doing seems to be hurting humanity, and in fact seems to be hurting the very humans that we spent the first half of the book building up and getting to know and bonding with. This is a huge change for the series, but I'd get rid of East Von entirely because we just didn't introduce him, or I would use East Von instead of the Red Drake. But either way, whoever's the messenger that we have the 
eats the Fukushima power plant and announces to humans to get ready for the end of the world. They're the ones that are going to be the head of the North American territory, and they're the ones that are going to come to the fall feast. I think, based on how the series runs as a whole, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make Istvan the Griffin in charge of that announcement and in charge of the North American territories. And he is going to come to the Harvest Festival and demand to speak to Amy. He's going to let her know, like, hey, we've been observing you, and the reason we've been observing you is because you're using magic. This is a new thing. All that can be the same. Um, and it's dangerous, potentially, because any use of magic that's not controlled could damage the work that we've already done on the shield. We need to work together to help control your magic, and I'm going to actually leave Rory here with you to observe what's going on and see if he can help step in so that you don't use your magic and so we can get a handle on this. And I would use this because, number one, Rory this werewolf guy, he eventually becomes the romantic interest and this is a way for them to get to know each other that's less forced. But also Rory in his, his human form looks completely human so he can just be like a dude who wandered into town. He can kind of be undercover. And that would be a cool use of his human appearance and he can, you know, be a great ambassador to the rest of the Fareem and having Farine come in and out of this town, it will give not just Rory, but others can come in and out. Maybe that's how we're introduced to some of these other characters. From the farm that we've already established all these characters with, we can go ahead and give Amy these magic history lessons, how to use your magic kind of lessons. Maybe we can have Rory stepping in some of the healing so he can do like more controlled versions of healing. Also, having Rory there all the time gives a Fareen represent, representative there on site experiencing what humans are experiencing with them, which could help build empathy and understanding our perspective versus their perspective. Um, other Fareen who come in might start up trade routes or might be able to teach different skills or even provide spells or items that could help the settlement here. And it could help um, build a relationship between humans and Fareen in general. One of the uh, issues in the book is that humans are wary and untrusting of Fareen for good reason. So if we show Fareen being good and doing things to help, then it will start to make sense when people start to trust them. And if the Fareen get more involved in humans, then they'll care more about humanity too. And this will help us, you know, start to build a rule. It'll help the reader start to build a relationship too, because we care about the people we've read about so far. So having these Fareen start caring about them will help bring people to their level. Now this is a really different beginning to this book and to the a really different ending to this book, and would be would change how the series going forward is shaped. If you wanted the series to still conform. What I would do at this point is I would have the Farine hierarchy, King Harold and his inner circle get involved and one of them would come in and say like, hey, we're going to do these trials and all of the magic bound humans are going to have to become familiars or die and you have to come to the trial so you can be paired up. And then we can have Rory and Istvan and some of the other Farine that we've gotten to know in this like, um, social structure we've created, protest. Then be like, hey, that's not fair, that's not right, this is Amy's magic. All those things that we would expect an ally to do, they could do here. And they can realize that it's out of their control. This is something that King Harold has decided. It's too big a risk. There are too many humans with magic. The way the training is going is sporadic. And we can't risk it, so we're going to pair them up. And they're not going to have a choice on it. And then at the trials, we can make those a lot shorter. We can, instead of doing like all the history, um, have us interact with a whole bunch of humans that either die or that we never deal with again ever, we can just have them do like the hand-to-hand -hand combat and we can have them do the vigil that I never even talked about at the end. And then after that, we can pair them up with their furry partners and we can go into a book to exactly the same. 
So that's something you could do if you want to keep the series largely unchanged. Just that little change where we humanize some of the farine and we show they're not a monolith of people and some of them are capable of empathizing and relating to humans and some of them want to help humanity would go a long way to showing that they have the potential to be allies and that they might be a benevolent and thoughtful species. Um, that they don't feel that they're just so above humans and they can do whatever they want and say that it's for the best of humanity. That would help us. Um, but, you know, personally, if it were my story, I would keep Amy there. We would never do the trials. The trials feel very gimmicky and they don't feel like they're utilized in a way that makes sense to me. I think instead of doing the familiar thing, eventually Amy's magic would progress enough that she would get an apprenticeship with Eastvan. Her and her family would go to his base so that she could be closer to him and study under him. And her family would go too because they'd want to be close to her. And at that point in time, maybe Farine and humans are mixing more. So it makes sense for like the humans to go to a Farine village and maybe some of the other Farine want to take over the farm and everyone sees it as a good exchange and sees it as a way to grow and learn from each other. So my final pitch on this would be for Eastvan to be the griffin that announces the terms of the human apocalypse and destroying Fukushima. And instead of having any trials, I would go ahead and make it a more personal journey where Eastvan comes to Amy explains the situation to her and puts Rory in there to help her to a certain point where he can't continue to help her anymore and then they decide to have an apprenticeship and I would close with Amy moving in with Eastvan for her apprenticeship. I would change almost nothing in the first half of the book. This book is really well written and there's quite a few ideas that are a lot of fun. I just want to tweak a little, a couple things here and there to make the motivations of the farine seem more relatable to the reader and to make them feel like a potentially benevolent species because it's clear that Jenny Schwartz wants them to be a benevolent species. It's clear she wants this to be peaceful and for humans to join the farine to all become one group together. But I just think that there are a couple of steps in that journey that are missing. So that would be basically how I would change it. Almost everything that Jenny Schwartz writes fits into my alternative take. It just happens a little bit differently and it gets rid of a couple of characters who and a couple character moments that don't do anything not only in this book but in the next series as well. Um, they're just not. All the humans at the human trials, the only one that we ever mention or see again ever is Chen and even what happens with him we could write it off. We could do without in the rest of the series. It's enough to say like hey, there are some humans with magic, and this story specifically is about Amy and her, how she deals with magic and the farine around her. So that's what I would change. What do you guys think? Would you change something else? Have you read the farine apocalypse? Did you like it? Why or why not? And do you have another book or series like it that I could read? I would love to take some recommendations and read some more. I usually love post-apocalyptic fiction. This past year, it's been too stressful for me to read anymore. But I feel like I could get back on the horse and start reading some more post-apocalyptic stories. So if you have like a great one to help me get, uh, help me fall in love with the genre again, I'll go ahead and suggest it in the comments down below. Thanks for coming to the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button. If you want more like this, go ahead and hit the subscribe. And also, I have a whole playlist of workshop fits here, so go ahead, feel free and check out some of the other ones that I've done. So thanks for listening to me and making it to the end of this, and I hope to see you guys next time. Bye!